Welcome to another episode of the IFC's Individuation Podcast. I am Dr. Wahab El Samurai. With me today is Dr. Eric Tomlinson. Um, and today we are going to go, to go back to Mary Louise von Franz's very um, fascinating world of fairy tales. So we're going to read you a Russian fairy tale today for all of our Russian fans. I hope this uh, makes you excited and happy. I'm going to read um, a little bit of the intro for this to um, help you connect the dots of where we're going to go today. So uh, in chapter three, she says, the connection between the state of sleep and a great journey or quest is depicted in an original way as a journey of the eyes. A dream is in most cases a visual experience in which we perceive a series of inner pictures. Often, even without being directly involved in the action, this probably prompts the primitive belief that it is easy, the eyes themselves that go out and travel around and communicate wonderful experiences. A fairy tale from Kanti, Khanti, indigenous people of Russia, the man who remained under the earth. So, um, what we do know is that in Jungian psychology, um, psychic energy is the modality, is the vehicle that um, we are able to move from the inner world to the outer world. Um, so from the world of matter to the world uh, of the psyche, of the spirit. So from matter to spirit, we travel in that path through uh, psychic energy. So the psychic energy is deepened within the unconscious. It carries us into the another world. It carries us into this spiritual psychic realm. And we're saying spiritual and psychic, we're not meaning uh, religious. We're meaning more of the non-material world, the deep of the unconscious. How do we get there is the question. Uh, the answer would be psychic energy. Psychic energy carries us there. So. Why would there be psychic energy to carry us into the underworld if there was no reason for the underworld? So that puts us in a place to rethink what the fairy tale is telling us. That journey is required for us to move forward um, in our experience, in um, the experience of the self to become whole or and the experience of the self to see the edges of the universe. It is that psychic energy that helps us go where, what um, a famous quote from Star Trek, where no one has ever gone before. So um, as we start today, uh, Lisa Hung is uh, unfortunately not with us today. She will rejoin us next week. So we miss Lisa, but she uh, unavailable today. So I'm going to start out by having Dr. Eric Tomlinson uh, read the story. And then from there, we will start to break it down and understand the story of what it's trying to tell us. So without further ado, Dr. Tomlinson, why don't you read us this magnificent Russian story. Be happy to, uh, Dr. Lahab, and let me thank you first for that introduction. Um, I wish von Franz had that same introduction uh, printed before uh, the story because hearing it helped me um, understand a few dynamics when I read it that I didn't understand when I read her introduction. So I thought your introduction was very helpful. Uh, both in helping me to see that the spiritual or psychic realm goes beyond the religious world. It, it, it's, it's, um, 
I mean, it's almost cosmic. It, it really is cosmic in a lot of ways. And, um, and I see that when I read this story. So I'll go it ahead. It leads and us, that. Eric, you brought a great point. It leads us into the world of the subatomic. Quantum. Yes, the quantum world. Go on. That's, that's exactly I'm reading what, the. I'm sorry. That's, a, that's exactly what I thought about when you were speaking. So thank you for that. The older of two hunters laid himself down to sleep, during which time the younger busied himself skinning the winnings of the hunt. As this one was working, he noticed that the door opened, a crack, and two eyes rolled out. He set out in chase and saw how they rolled over hills, across the river, and up to a falling cedar tree that blocked the trail. Then the eyes crawled under the trunk of the cedar tree. The young man stood waiting in front of the tree. The eyes slowly crept out and rolled the same way back again from whence they had come. Now, to mark the path, the young man cut some wood, wood chips and strewed them along the way. The eyes rolled back into the hut and into the clothes of the old man that's lying asleep. In the meantime, their meal, which had been cooking in a pot over the fire, was ready, and the two men sat themselves down to eat. The younger hunter asked the older one if he had dreamt anything. The older one said, indeed, I had a dream. Under the fallen trunk of a cedar tree, I saw a veritable treasure. Now, first thing next morning, they set out <clears throat> and followed the trail of wood chips all the way to the big cedar. Then they began to dig and found a cavern into which the old man crawled. He fell into the living room where a woman was sitting on a bed. And she said, all my life, I have waited for you. Finally, you have come. She suggested that he stay with her and her treasure. And he agreed. However, he wished to have a word with his partner. She, allow, she allowed him on the condition that he speak only one word. He tried to find the exit, but could not see any way. The woman said, just where you are standing, look up and go there. He looked up and saw an open door. The man and woman went out together and found the young man almost starving from hunger. The older man asked the woman, whom should I notify that this young man is close to dying? The woman brought a small flask out of her pocket and gave the young man a spoonful of the water that was in the flask. He immediately recovered and began to speak. The old man interrupted and said, go back to my house and tell my people that I am staying here. The young man set out an older man and the older man went with the woman back into her underground room and both of them are still there under the earth. Under the earth. Beneath the earth. There's realms beneath the earth. So this is, uh, that under the earth is basically the unconscious. It's what is unseen, unknown. It is untouched by eyes. But in this story, what we have is rolling eyes. You know, when your eyes roll, it's like when you're sleeping, your eyes roll back. Or they start moving from right to left. Um, basically, um, they're processing. But internally, symbolically, they are seeing the underworld. They are in the underworld. Uh, where your body is no longer required. Your eyes are the vision that is used to um, go through the underworld and learn about the underworld. Now, you do have some form in the underworld. It depends on the uh, projection of that form. That form can be anything as we have known from earlier from these earlier stories. 
of guardian animals to magicians, shamans, to moons, to suns that have transformative power. So you don't necessarily go into the underworld as yourself, meaning that the self that is represented in the um, world of matter on when you are awake. In that world, you exist in material form. In the underworld, you exist in um, a spirit form. And in that spirit form, all kinds of magical things can occur. One of those magical things is the rolling eyes. So you have a pair of eyes that are rolling over hills and looking around corners and uh, gathering information, going further. So um, we also use, um, in fairy tales, we also use the vision of the eagle or the vision of the falcon where um, we project ourselves into the bird to see outside of ourselves. We get to see much further than we are able to with just our eyes or with uh, just a pair of glasses. Um, these ideas actually inspired us to create magnifying glasses um, and binoculars. The, all these ideas came from that idea is like, I want to see further. I want to see as far as possible. I want to see the stars. I want to see the stars up close. I don't want to see a flicker of light. I want to see what is on the star. Who is sitting there? What are they doing? What did you think of the story, Eric? Well, just before I say that, just to support that point you just made, it, it, it never ceases to amaze me that in every story we've read thus far, uh, there is, uh, you talk about the underworld or underground being <clears throat> another dimension. And we've, all, we've already in past stories talked about the sky being in another dimension. Ooh. And Yet there are always openings. Yes. There's always either a hole in the sky or a cave in the ground. There's always access to both. Mm -hmm. And that is a very positive thing for me. Mm -hmm. That means if I can explore those, if I am in tune with them. Yes. So I just wanted to make that point. Yeah. And also that these openings... Um, if we want to take our imagination to other places, other dimensions, um, they're like um, black holes. These holes that pull you in into time and um, in terms of Einstein. Very good analogy. He talks about how um, time starts uh, going back in the black hole. You start to be able to go back in time through the black hole. So these are other dimensions. These are other gates to other dimensions that give us the ability to see the world that we want to see, the world that we can't see, the world that we can't access, the world that's not accessible to the mortal on um, the earthly plane. It is this realm that we're talking about that creates the magic of our earthly plane. This is when we are able to build skyscrapers. This is when we build uh, a backup sound for the truck. So it beeps like that as it keeps beeping outside. I, I hear one now. <clears throat> Those are the sounds that come from the imagination. Our imagination is where creation exists. It is not in our earthly form, in our form as organic matter, that uh, we are creative. Our creation, our creativity comes from the depth, comes from the underworld, comes from the rolling eyes, 
that roll over the hills. So what is, it, what is this story about? So we have um, the older of two hunters laid himself down to sleep. So um, at the beginning of the story, most of these stories is um, there is a, you have to go into the unconscious to be able to get to where you are going. In that, he says, um, she says, I'm sorry, himself down to sleep, during which time the younger busied himself skinning the winnings of the hunt. As this one was working, he noticed that the door opened a crack and two eyes rolled out. So he's in the dream world, in the other dimension, as Eric pointed out. This other dimension is where um, he sets out in a chase and saw how they rolled over the hills and across the river and up to fallen cedar tree that blocked the trail. Then the eyes crawled under the trunk of the cedar tree. The young man stood waiting in front of the tree. The eyes slowly crept out and rolled the same way back again from whence they had come to mark the path. The young man cut some wood chips and strewed them along the way. The eyes rolled back into the hut and into the clothes of the old man lying asleep. In the meantime, their meal, which had been cooking in a pot over the fire, was ready, and the two men sat themselves down to eat. The young hunter asked the older one if he had dreamt anything. So this is what we do in the morning. We ask each other, hey, did you have a dream last night? What did you dream about? Or in, in more practical terms, where people are sitting and are being interviewed and one person asks the other, it's like, well, tell me about your dreams. What are, what are your goals? This is another word for dreams, right? Because goals are uh, ethereal. They're somewhere else. They're not here. They're goals, <clears throat> you know? Um, so they're asking us about our dreams. People ask us about our dreams all the time. Where do you see yourself? Hence the line, remember the line. Where do you see yourself in five years? Rolling eyes. <laughs> I want you to use your rolling eyes to roll over the hills and see yourself in the future. Where do you see yourself? We are still asking the same questions as the fairy tale is asking. Although it seems a little bizarre that eyes are rolling, it's not that bizarre because we're asked to roll our eyes all the time by so many different people. Um, they ask us to roll our eyes to the past and say, tell me about where you were and where you're going. That's another line that people use is like, uh, okay, tell me your story, another one. We ask these questions all the time. We're just using different languages. The, the meaning is pretty much the same. It's like knock it on its head, right? It is exactly the same. It's the same kind of what we, we have forgotten the language of the fairy tale. And now we think that we're asking some, uh, what is it? Some uh, profound questions. I'm going to ask you some questions. I know they're not like the usual questions, like uh, where do you see yourself? Or I want you to tell me your vision. Another rolling eye story. Tell me your vision. Okay, uh, vision, okay. Uh, I'll tell you about my vision. So these are things that we talk about all the time. They're in our daily lexicon. They're in the way we communicate. They're in the way we tell stories to each other. They're in the way we woo each other, right? We use metaphor, we use symbols, and we use um, poetry. Hence, Jung says that the mind is mythopoetic. It tells story 
and it likes to rhyme. What do you think, Eric? Can I say something about dreams and rolling eyes? Yes. We, we roll our eyes more during sleep than we do at any other time in our life. Correct. It's called rapid eye movement. Mm -hmm. And it's when, we, it's, it's when we are in the REM state, REM, R-E-M, rapid eye movement. And out of every 90 minutes throughout the night of our sleep, Ooh. about every 90 minutes, Ooh. anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes on average is devoted to REM sleep. Ooh. The rest of the time is devoted to stage one, two, three, and four sleep. Mm. Now, this is what I wanted to say about it. Mm. Our, paras our, ner our autonomic nervous system, that's the nervous system that runs automatically without us having to do anything. Mm. It's what helps us breathe. It's what helps things go on when we're asleep so that we don't die. It's called mm. the autonomic nervous system. And there's two mm. branches. Mm. There's the parasympathetic, mm. and that's called rest and digest. Mm. Then there's the sympathetic. Mm -hmm. And that's fight or flight. Mm -hmm. Now get this. Mm -hmm. I know you know this, but maybe some of our listeners don't. Mm -hmm. And that is when our body is gaining its rest, we are in the parasympathetic mode of our mm -hmm. autonomic nervous system. In other words, all the dials are turned way down. Mm -hmm. It's the closest to death that we can come. Okay. Now, when we're in REM sleep, not only is the sympathetic nervous system going on, our brain is utilizing more oxygen when we're dreaming than if we were awake doing mathematic problems. Ooh. The point behind this. Fascinating, is, is that not? Is that not fascinating? That is fascinating. And that tells us that these holes in these other dimensions, this is just my opinion. Yeah. I think you'll agree, but these holes in these other dimensions can be accessed during these dreams if we're able to learn how to understand their meanings. Correct. I wanted to throw that out and see what no, you thought. I, I, I think that's fantastic. I mean, we talk about that in accordance with the uh, Jungian advanced motor processing. We talk about that in JAMP all the time because that's part of the process of gym. That's exactly what we're doing. We are doing eye movement to help the system integrate. And so what happens in sleep is that you're integrating um, everything yes. that happened in that day. That's why you need a shutdown. You are basically integrating. That's why your eye movement is going back and forth. You're integrating information, you're integrating knowledge that you've accessed you're integrating forms of consciousness uh, back into the unconscious it's there for psychic recovery correct and healing and understanding and that's what we do in young advanced motor processing yes psychic recovery and healing and integration and the movement of the energy as eric pointed out um there's more oxygen in the brain when we're sleeping. It's interesting. It's like uh, an astronaut uh, putting on a suit uh, to go into places where um, there's no oxygen. Well, actually, not even oxygen. There's time and space are irrelevant. Um, you could be your child self. You could be your adult self. You could be your old self. You could be many people. You could be different people, you could be pieces of people, you could be animals, you could be trees, you could be plants, you could be planets, you could be anything. In that case, what happens is that we are, the brain is basically working overtime when it reaches out into the unconscious. What does that tell us? What does that tell us about this dimension that, we're, what, that we visit every night? The dimension is vast. The dimension has many, um, many edges to it. And we have to figure out where we are, what we're doing and what is occurring, right? And so the story is, is that we're invited into the realm and it's not like we're sitting in the darkness waiting for anything. It's like these two hunters. Right? 
there is a process. There's something going on. We're doing something. We're um, in a story. We are either running from something, we are hiding from something, we're fighting something, we're loving something, uh, we're creating something, we are transforming into something, um, we are seeing something. So it's always there's something um, very, um, very exciting going on. Why is it exciting? It's exciting is because it's happening um, in movie form. Basically, yes. I love that you said what you just said, because in all of these stories, the dreamer is always actively involved. Correct. They're always actively involved into these other world dimensions that relate to their own, their own material world. Correct. So this is a, then the question becomes, um, am I the... Am I the creator of the dream or the, is the dream the creator of me? Is the dream dreaming me up or am I dreaming the dream? That's always fascinating. I know it sounds a little kind of weird, like, oh, you know, you're just being obtuse. Um, no. The dream world, when you're in the dream world, who created it? How was it created? Why does it tell you a story that uh, you don't know? Or it tells you a story you do know, but changes it. Or it creates a story that you should know and you end up creating it. Most of our great uh, thinkers solve problems through the dream. They could not solve it by calculations. They could not solve it by hammering things in. They could not solve it by rereading the same material. They could not solve it through discussion. They couldn't solve it through sitting there and staring at it. They could not solve it. How did they solve it? They fell asleep and the answer came. And so throughout history, some of the greatest minds uh, in history, um, they say, you know, uh, I found the solution in the dream. I found the solution when I woke up. No, you didn't. <laughs> the solution was given to you. Okay, so the question is, the most exciting question about the fairy tales is, um, who's giving you the stuff? Where's it coming from? Do we ever ask ourselves, where's this coming from? Who's generating this? Oh, you know, they're kind of random images in my mind. Really? Random images of things you've never seen, places you've never been. Random? How, how is that random? Where? Random means that I've seen it and it's kind of a collage thing that's being put together. No. Even the collage is part of the unconscious dream. The reason things, patterns make sense to us is because of the dream. The dream fills in the pattern. It shows us the path we need to take. Yeah. It's so when, we, when, when the prince dreams of the love of his life and she is not the princess, but this uh, poor peasant girl somewhere, but he has never met her. Or in the uh, dream of... Um, the dream of uh, the young shepherd who dreams of the queen. And he goes to her and she sends him the ring that he ends up giving to her in a flask when she offers him beer. I mean, it's fascinating, right? So um, we find different uh, ways of connecting to the other. So who is calling out? Who is setting this up? Where are they? What are they doing? Who is setting up these things in motion? And how come that the dream is an imperative? For instance, we have people who say, you know, I've had this reoccurring dream. Okay, obviously we haven't gotten the message, so the dream has to keep coming back. Okay, why is it reoccurring? Why, why can't I say, you know, I'm not gonna do it? <laughs> and that's it. Because we don't have a choice in certain things. We don't have the choice because the choice has already been made. 
psychically by us, that this is our path. Now, if we resist our path, we are still going to walk our path. So Jung has a saying of you could follow it uh, willingly or you could be dragged by it, kicking and screaming. But you shall go down that path. Right? So the first thing that, that we see in uh, fairy tales is when you come up to an old person, like an older man, an older woman, and they explain to you that this path is treacherous. There is an easier path that you could take. But the people who take the easier path um, live very normal lives. The dangerous path will lead to a very exciting, very fulfilling life. So where is that, where is that voice coming from? That's the question today for our listeners. I want you to think about the dream and the voice of the dream. Where is it coming from? Who is calling you? What is calling you? What is being explained to you? Where is it taking you? Because that's what we're doing with uh, the fairy tale. What we're trying to do is trying to show you that people from across this great earth of ours have dreams. And those dreams are all interconnected to creation and to our creation into our stories they make up but where are these stories coming from who's calling out who's telling you these stories and how come there's such a variety of stories and how come they come from different places so in young's uh in uh, young when he was working and finding archetypes um one of his patients was dreaming of Egyptian ruins and the man with a Swiss uh, villager who was schizophrenic, who had never been outside the country, not alone seeing the ruins in the ancient ruins of Egypt. And a lot of these ancient uh, ruins were not discovered yet during that time. He dreamt of a ruin that had not been discovered yet. And he described it almost perfectly. And this is where Jung said, um, got the idea of the archetype, that there are archetypal patterns. Because how is this Swiss villager who is somewhat illiterate, not really kind of not, an intellectual, not somebody who reads the paper, not somebody who goes searching for books or adventures or how did he create this? And how did he know it so well? So years later, Young sees the description of the ancient ruins in a Swiss newspaper that had just been discovered. And after hearing this guy, that's where he said, the way there's something wrong here. How would he know? How does he know this? So this is where we are. We are, um, as we move forward in the world, as we move forward in time, we're actually moving backwards. And that's the trick, right? That's the trick. The trick is you're always one foot ahead and 10 steps back but you don't know which one it is until much later, until you have gone through there. And then you're still questioning how you got to where you got. Like, so for our listeners today, I want you to think of yourself right now in the world. How did you get to where you got? Simple question. How did you get to where you got? You're going to start trying to connect things like, well, you know, I, I moved to California and then a friend called and said, would you like to live in Miami? And I thought, you know, uh, it would be nice to have people around. So I moved to Miami and said, so how did you get to Tumbuktu? (laughs) And the person goes, I have no idea. (laughs) Somehow, somewhere, I've always wanted to be in Tumbuktu. By the way, Tumbuktu is a real place. Just for those who are listening to us, thinking that we're making up stuff. That, that's a real place. Um, 
Eric, you're smiling. What uh, what's on your mind? Well, I was smiling about the ten buck too because mm -hmm. I was thinking about Marrakesh, but that's yeah. another story for another day. Yes. I uh, what I did want to ask you though, it, and I've got my own thoughts about this, but I but when you were talking about how many people have come up with ideas or had their ideas become ho more holistic and complete through dream the dreaming state solutions to problems as i started thinking about that for a couple of minutes and and i, I started thinking of the of the examples of that that i'm aware of and most of them and i this is just my experience i could be wrong about this but most of them that i'm aware of have happened either in the micro world or quantum world of science or they've happened in the cosmic world of science from Einstein down to biochemists to you name it. Ooh. And I'm wondering those, and I'm thinking to myself, those are two realms that most of our population on this planet know the least about. Ooh. So why is it in those two realms that we see that I'm, I could be wrong about this, but I think we see more evidence of understandings coming to people in their dreams in those two realms than in just the business world, for example. Yes, yeah, so it's the totality, it's the, it's the what Jung uh, talks about, the one world theory, which we are having a conference about, by the way. We'd love for you to join us. Um, and we're gonna have it live this year. We are very excited that by October, that hopefully that the United States of America will be vaccinated and we can um, actually uh, greet each other again in an open space. But until then, um, the one world theory is that we are all interconnected, that the subatomic and the um, cosmic worlds are connected, that it's one fabric and we have moved one, we are part of one fabric. We are. You know those quilts that they um, uh, that they put together, that they sew together, the quilts for the people who died of AIDS, the people who died in war, the people, or just quilts of family members, like different pieces from different family members, to show that we're all one family. This universe is a quilt, and it's integrated by the subatomic. And those pieces hold everything together. And within that realm, what we are discovering is another realm within the subatomic. There is actually a small realm. There is something mind boggling that we keep finding smaller and smaller particles, which is amazing. And this is not talking about dark matter. We really have no clue about dark matter. What its purpose is, why it exists, how it exists, and how much of um, the cosmos it covers. It covers a lot more of the cosmos than we can comprehend. Right? So, can, I, can, I, can I make yeah, interject a yeah, quick yeah, point yeah. about dark matter, Lahab? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I wanted to give kudos to the person who found, discovered dark matter. Yes. It, it, it was a woman, by a, a female scientist uh, who, her name was Vera Rubin. Ooh. And I don't know if she's still alive because this happened like in the 70s and 80s and she Ooh. was relatively older at that point in time, but they wouldn't allow her to work on black holes because she's a woman Ooh. and so they said you work on our work on our own galaxy you, you know why don't you stick to our own galaxy so she stuck to her own galaxy and discovered through her research that the outer planets or, or um, the outer parts of our galaxy Ooh. which in theory was supposed to be spinning much slower than the inner parts Ooh. of our galaxy because of gravity, she discovered that they were, that that wasn't true. And because of her findings, they came to realize that there's another 
kind of matter in our so in our you in our galaxy that is affecting that is counteracting the effects of gravity and it's called dark matter Ooh. so kudos to vera rubin one of our great female cosmologists Ooh. she might have been an astrophysicist but Ooh. i call her a cosmologist so i wanted to give kudos to her for that well i would like to give kudos to vera rubin also and um it's fascinating I mean, it's, uh, we are, we, what we know, what we know and what we learn every day is we don't know that much. <laughs> and that's what's beautiful about life is that we're learning things that um, every day from our experiences and our interest and in our imagination. And part of what we're trying to do with the fairy tales is to uh, ignite those imaginations, to have you think of all these fairy tales in the way that we think of these fairy tales as stories of discovery, as stories of understanding. What did these um, two hunters discover? What did they discover? And in the end it says, there they began to dig and they found a cavern, a hole in the earth. So there are holes in space. We call them black holes. There are holes in the earth. We call them caves and caverns. Oh, oh can I say, since yeah. you pause, can I say one more thing? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 gotta, I gotta give and Andrea Getz her kudos too, because isn't this ironic? The, the, the white male scientists that were the cosmologists said, no, Vera, you study that we're going to handle the black hole issue. Ooh. Guess who discovered the supermassive black hole in the center of our own galaxy? Ooh. It was Andrea Getz, yeah. another female super scientist. And yeah. it took her and her team 10 years and they charted all the planets in the center. Ooh. They, 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 uh, they had somebody had, somebody had created adaptive lensing to get rid of all the cloudiness Ooh. in their in their imagery but her and her team discovered the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy it was another female and i just saw something in the in the news the other day about how women in stem uh in in stem areas of study have gone way way down and i found that i i found that tragic Ooh. Because two of the great discoveries of our cosmo of our cosmic uh, uh, existence Ooh. were founded by two incredibly bright women. Yes, uh, so we we also would like to encourage all um, of our young listeners to think about going into these fields because these are fascinating fields and there's so much to discover in these fields. Yes. There is so much to discover in uh, the realm of the cosmos. There's so much to discover in these areas. And as we see more and more pictures of black holes and how they um, suck in everything in this, uh, in this massive, this energy is so immense. I mean, uh, it's, it blows imagination because it, it's so immense. It's so, um, it's such a, it's such a feeling to understand that whatever we think we are, we are not. Whatever we saw ourselves as, we are not. We are part of the many, we are one, we are part of the whole, we are separate from the whole. We're integrated into this world, but for some reason we come and go. But the spirit world, this psychic world, this cosmic world that we are talking about has, um, has a hold on us, has a hook in us. So what do you say? Well, I don't care about space. I don't care about the cosmos. Yes, but uh, it doesn't care. <laughs> it keeps pulling you back in, whether you like it or not. Even if you don't care or you don't want to, it still pulls you back in. 
Now, so when we talk about our ancestors from the beginning of the dawn of time, their fascination was always with the stars. They used the stars to map trails and to locate themselves in the water. This is how they are able to know how to navigate the ocean. Yes. They use the stars. So there, um, to get back to their cavern. Yeah, thanks for letting me share that, Lahab. Oh, my pleasure. There, they began to dig and found a cavern into which the old man crawled. He fell into the living room where a woman was sitting on a bed. <laughs> so he went into a cavern, fell into a living room, and there's a woman sitting on the bed. And she said, all my life, I have waited for you. Finally, you have come. You know, so the, the dream calls you out, sends you on a quest. In the quest, you find a cavern. And then you go into the cavern and you fall onto a bed. And there is this beautiful woman who's sitting there. She suggested that he stay with her and her treasure, and he agreed. However, he wished to have a word with his partner. She allowed him on the condition that he speak only one word. He tried to find the exit, but could not see any way. You know, the, the thing that we talk about, there's no way out. There's only going through. There is in psychology, in uh, young in psychology, we talk about this. We talk about you cannot get out. You have to walk through. You have to go through the experience to be able to put the experience aside and move forward. Oh, good point. Well, you cannot. You cannot just walk away from it. Like a hook, it is always following you around. And this is what we know about trauma. What happens in trauma is those, um, it doesn't let go. Even though we don't want to recall it, even though we don't want to think about it, even though we don't want to see it anymore, even though we want it as far as possible away from us, it keeps pulling us into it. It keeps pulling us into the pain, into the irritation, into the agitation, into uh, the fear, because the only way to work through, we have to work through it. We have to be, we have to go through it. We cannot exit. There is no exit. And so what we do in Jungian advanced motor processing, I know I'm repeating myself because we always talk about Jungian advanced processing. Um, we help the person move through. They Good don't goal. find a way out. They walk through. And that walking through is what we are discovering is the most um, healing to psyche. For example, when we talk about story, what happens? If somebody cuts off the story, if somebody like stops the story in the middle, we can't tolerate it. We're always trying to find an ending to the story. Oh, I didn't get to see the ending. Oh, I could guess the ending, but I really would like to see the ending. I really know what would happen. I'd really like to know how this ends. Right? Because our mind works on from the story. Our mind tells stories. And the stories always have some ending and that ending is a beginning to another story so it's it's, it's nice isn't it it's, it's like how the, the psyche messes with you the psyche likes to play the psyche is very creative it likes to play so as soon as one story ends it begins another story so what happens when the um when our friend here meets this woman he tried, she allowed him on the condition that he speak only one word. He tried to find the exit, but could not see any way. The woman said, just where you are standing, look up and go there. Look up and go there. He looked up and saw an open door. 
<laughs> so what happens when we when we have uh, when we're stuck? What is the thing that we don't do? The thing that we don't do when we're stuck is um, find the open door because we're not looking for the open door. We're thinking about being stuck. She gives him the key. This is a key. Look up and go there. So when you are stuck, everyone, when you are stuck on a problem, look up and go to where the solution is. So for example, when you are stuck on a problem you have with a person, think of another person and the solution will come because you have already been through this problem. You have already seen this problem. You have already worked through this problem. You just don't know it. It's basically taking a pause. People say, why don't you take a pause? Why don't you leave that? You know, what do we tell people when they're caught in the middle of a problem? Leave it for now. Think of something else. It'll work itself out, we say. Like magical, it'll work itself out. This is what the fairy tale says. This is what the fairy tales are telling us. Things will work themselves out because all of our imagination has a solution to whatever ails us. Everything that we're stuck in, our imagination has a solution for it. And, and therefore we get uh, shows like MacGyver. <laughs> so MacGyver is like the essence of solution-oriented thinking. It's like, well, no, there's a solution to this problem. Basically, this is the fairy tale. The fairy tale of MacGyver is that he always looks up and he, he doesn't look at the problem anymore. He's not stuck staring at the problem. What are you doing? I'm staring at this problem. I can't seem to fix it. Why do you keep staring at it? I'm trying to find a solution. Staring at the problem does not find a solution. You can't right. find a solution sure. staring at the problem. <laughs> the problem in itself exists as a problem. It's a symbol of the problem. So when you're staring at the problem, you're staring at the symbol. That is a problem. So what you have to do is stare up, down, left, right, but don't stare at it. Staring at it is being pulled into it. Can I speak to this, Lahab? Yeah, 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 please go ahead. Just on a personal level, you know, the first two thirds of my life, I was that person that was stuck. Ooh. Even to the point of once I got my doctorate, my, my uh, middle teenage daughter was talking to me one time and she said, you're supposed to know the answer to this. Ooh. You're supposed to be helping me with this. You, you're not helping me. And, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, <clears throat> to myself, why am I not figuring this out? Mm. Uh, because I was so stuck on what I was not able to do, correct, and what I was not able to understand, correct, and and the guilt and shame I felt about that, especially being educated, yeah. and and then I, I and then just like almost in every one of these stories and every one of our dreams. There's always somebody else there that helps you. That woman helped her. She said, stand where you are and look. Yeah. That's where you need to look. Yeah. Look up. Because, because he was focused in a hole. Yes. And she he was, was saying, down. look at that. Yeah. Look up. If you're and, looking and, down, look up. And so I started asking for help at that point. Yeah. And now let me say this. Yeah. Before I started getting that help, here's what happened to all that stuff that I wasn't working out. Ooh. I projected it onto other people. Ooh. Yes. Well, because we're stuck, right? It's because we're stuck. When we're stuck, we get frustrated because we're stuck. The further we get stuck, the reason that we keep like digging the hole 
you know, the, you know the saying, stop digging the hole. You know, you keep digging the hole, stop digging the hole. And they're like, oh, I can't stop. I have to find out what's going on. Well, um, it's the hole is the problem. It's getting out of the hole. That's the solution. Yeah. <laughs> it seems simple enough. Yet it's like a, it's yeah, like like it's like a brain twister. It's like a puzzle. It's like, how do I do this? What do you mean? How, how do I stop digging? Well, let go of the shovel, put it down, start crawling out of the hole. Just, just do that. That easy? It's not that easy. You know, I've, I've heard this a lot. I, I've said this. It's not that easy, but it's like, of course it is it's easy. It's easy when you let go. I always think of two kids. I always think of two little kids um, to grab each other. And I remember this because I was in residential and I, I, I saw conflict all the time. So there's two little kids and one kid is holding the other kid. And he goes, you let go. No, he said, no, you let go first. No, you let go. No, you let go. No, you let go. <laughs> neither, of one, neither of them wants to let go. But they keep saying the same thing. They know the solution. The solution is coming out of their mouth. But it's not hitting their consciousness. They're saying it. That's the solution, right? I let go. You let go. But they can't seem to let go. Why? Because they're stuck on the problem. They're stuck on holding on. And that's what we do. I use this, I use this um, example because that's exactly what we do. We keep holding on, even though the problem is saying the solution is to let go. And you say, uh, no, I'm gonna hold on. Have you, we've heard people say, we've said ourselves, yeah. this is my problem, I will resolve it. I will solve it. It's my problem. Well. Um, no, it's not. It's a problem. It's not yours. There, there is no, you don't own the problem. <laughs> You're just caught in the middle. You just think it's like a, it's a, a trap. You've walked into a trap and now you're saying it's my trap. Well, you're never going to get out of the trap because all you see is your own creation. And so, Dr. Lahab, yes, we, we complicate it. When yeah. we when we take that stance that you just yeah. said, yeah. we complicate the snot out of it. I mean, yes. I, I don't know who said it, but he said there's a difference between something that's easy and simple. Yes. He said you can stand on the edge of a cliff. Mm. It's a real simple process to jump yeah. up to step off that cliff. Yeah. All you have to do is take one step yeah. forward. Yeah. It's simple. Yeah. It's, it's simple. not complicated. It's not complicated. But it's not easy to do. No. And when we get to that point and we're, we're like, you're talking about, yeah. I have to fix it myself, blah, 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 blah. And then we turn it into this big complicated with 90 different tentacles mm. of, you know, of the octopus surrounding it. Mm. And it's really something simple. It's just hard to do. And that's when we need the help from someone else. Well, yeah, because at the point when you actually ask for help, what you have said is, I see the problem. I'm stuck in the problem. I'm going to reach out. As soon as you reach out, the problem starts to dissolve. As soon as your hand leaves the trap, the problem itself starts to fall apart. It's oh, well apart. said. It, you're no longer trapped in that uh, bear trap. It's, it's, it's gone. It starts to work itself out. Because this is your trap. These are um, these are these are psychological um, holes that we dig for ourselves, and with our shovel. So the further we dig, so I I know that there are very complicated problems. I know that people have had, and not to make light of it, we've all had problems. right, right. Um, yet. The solution to the problem is always not holding on to the problem. So that's what I could say very clearly. The solution to the problem is don't hold on to it. 
Don't own it. It's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. We own our mistakes. We own our past. But problems are not owned by us. Right? These are complicated webs. These are psychologically complicated webs that we weave. And then uh, like a spider that gets trapped by its own web. The spider's, the spider's exterior does not stick to the web. That's how the spider can move around the web without a problem. But think if the spider didn't have that skin, the spider would get caught in their own web. They would be stuck. As soon as they move left or right, they would wrap themselves in their own web. Okay, so... Um, he looked up and saw an open door. The man and the woman were out together and found the young man almost starving from hunger. The older man asked the woman, whom should I notify that this young man is close to dying? The woman brought a small flask out of her pocket and gave the young man a spoonful of the water that was in the flask. So this is when... Um, Dr. Tomlinson says, ask for help. <laughs> this is the help. Huh? They ask for help. Well, how, how, how do I help this person? He immediately recovered and began to speak. The old man interrupted and said, go back to my house and tell me, tell my people that I am staying here. The young man set out and the older man went with the woman back into her underground room. And both of them are still there under the earth. Dr. Oh. Lahab, I don't understand why he was starving. Oh, um, he was starving of love. He was starving of not having love. Now, how do you come to that? I, I, I don't, I'm not connected this is, with it. Well, so I'll read it again to you. He says, the older man asked, he looked up and saw the open door. The man and the woman went out together and found the young man almost starving from the hunger. Um, he, he's basically, he has, um, he, his ability to take care of himself is connected to the old man. Okay, got it now. Got it. So the older man, the older man asked the woman, who should I notify that this young man is close to dying? The woman brought out small, then this is, this is all symbolic of, of him. This is his life. He was starving before he met her. The old man. Yeah. As a young man, he was starving. Yet he was a hunter. And what we know about hunters is they have plenty of meat and food. They're hunters. Their job in life is to gather food. So how is it that you're starving? They're starving of love, eros. And then he dies, right? He stays under the earth. He goes into the spirit realm. It's a beautiful story. It's, um, it's a beautiful story. So, um, any thoughts, Dr. Tomlinson? Um, any thoughts before we say adieu? Yeah, just, just one super brief last point. I forgot the name of the TV series. I've watched it and found it incredible. It goes back to the feminine brain, which I'm amazed by in my biochemical and neuroscience studies of the feminine brain, because there are, regardless of what people say, there are differences between the male and the female brain. It's huge. Difference. And this show was about a chess, a female chess player. I think it's even won awards. It just came out, I think, this past year. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I forgot the name of it. 
Yes. Uh, Knight's think, Gambit. Yes. Queen's Gambit. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful story. Yeah. It's not about a single woman. It's really a composite of two or three other real fe female chess players. Yeah. And it was just a brilliant expose on how the right hemisphere, right frontal lobe brain of a female can achieve the same similar levels of, of, of achievement that the male right front hemispheric brain has done. Mm. Because if you want to talk about cosmology having been predominantly a male, <laughs> a, 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 a white male uh, dominated uh, engagement, there's nothing that's been more that way than chess. Mm. And it's a wonderful story that I think uh, all everybody should see, male and female, but especially young females, to see that there is no limit to what your brain can accomplish. With that, uh, we want to thank you listeners for this week's podcast. Lisa will be with us uh, back next week. Uh, I am Dr. Lahab El Samurai. This is Dr. Eric Tomlinson. This is the IFC's Individuation Podcast, and we are um, we are delighted. Um, we are delighted for our, that we get so much um, love from our listeners. Um, please join us for next week. <laughs>